Hi, everyone. Welcome to the, uh, I guess this is the third of our uh, Athletics Canada webinar series. Um, today we're going to talk about video analysis, and we've got three uh, very uh, experienced and uh, well-spoken coaches to, to share their expertise with you on that. Um, just a couple things to, to start before I introduce people. Um, so if you have questions, you can put them in the question box. You can type in a question. And uh, our friend Kyle Smith is behind the scenes here, and he's going to manage that and uh, let us know about your questions if you have them along the way, uh, and then we can, we can get those answered for you. Um, if you're having technical issues, if you can't hear or anything like that, um, then you can also send a note in the chat and Kyle will sort of flag that for us and, and everything. But it seems like getting too many uh, chat question. No. Okay. So it seems like we're good. So um, we'll start with just a little bit of introduction of, of who we've got here. So we've got Richard Parkinson. Um, who is a chartered professional coach. He's the Athletics Canada High Performance and National Team Coach for Throws. Uh, he's an NCCP Performance Coach and IAAF Level 5 Elite Throws Coach. And he coaches multiple uh, CAP athletes and his club is Club Sisu. He coached top six women in the shot last year in Canada. Um, so uh, yeah, can't wait to hear from Richard. Uh, we also have Jason Rindel. Uh, so Richard, if you don't know who they are, well, they do have their names there. Richard's in the black shirt. Jason Rindel's in the, the red shirt with hair. Uh, yeah. I'm the red shirt with no hair. Um, Jason Rindel, CHPC, is the current head coach of the Saskatchewan University of Saskatchewan Huskies track and field team. Uh, he's a three-time national team coach. Uh, he's a performance coach uh, certified and a master coach developer, so he helps us uh, develop our coaches here in Canada. And we have uh, in his uh, gray UBC hoodie, Laurie Primo, uh, is the head coach at UBC track and field. Competed for Canada in the triple jump, decathlon, 400 meter hurdles. Uh, he's coached national team athletes in the sprints and the hurdles, high jump, javelin, heptathlon, and decathlon. Um, some notable athletes, Liz Gleadle, Mike Mason. Kyle Nielsen and Manuddle, who is a British high jump champ and Scottish record holder. So we have a great panel uh, today to talk about uh, video analysis. Um, so I guess the first question that I'll just sort of, you know, open to everybody is why should coaches incorporate video analysis into their uh, their coaching practice? Richard, do you want to start? Jason, you want to start? I believe that they. Uh, should... No, go. Who's, who's starting here? Go ahead. You're just a little delayed. Okay. Yeah, well, I I think that. Okay. I have uh, slow internet, I believe. So, um, I think coaches need to you uh, add it in for uh, monitoring purposes uh, to check on how they're doing against the technical model that they're using. Uh, as a learning experience to help athletes uh, see what they're doing um, and then as a teaching tool uh, for other coaches. So there's there's lots of purposes. Cool. Jason? Yeah, just building off of that, you know, within your IST team, your physiotherapists, your chiropractors, uh, you know, they can benefit from viewing video also when we're talking about in that integrated approach. And, you know, it it looks cool, you know, to the athletes. So, you know, they can learn and benefit from it that way. All right. Laurie? Yeah, so I think I'm going to say the same thing and articulate it maybe a, a little bit differently. Um, I, I'm sure there are multiple reasons. I've found four very useful ones. Um, the first is that the athlete is not performing or executing a technical cue based on my verbal commands or any demonstration that I can provide um, and that you know perhaps they're more of a visual learner. Um, the second is that they're performing extraneous movements, movements I don't want them to perform and I think that that may lead to injury if we don't correct it and, and that's where Jason's point about using IST I think is really important. Uh, and the third primary one is that sometimes it just helps an athlete's confidence to see themselves and, and to point out things that they're doing really well, as opposed to try to use it as a corrective tool. Um, and then I, I would say that the fourth kind of, it's not primary, but maybe a secondary reason is that 
the next generation of coaches is probably coming from our athlete pool. And I think it really helps them learn and develop a coach's eye by seeing not only themselves, but maybe other athletes in your group. Cool. Good. Um, I like that. So I guess the, the next question would be, are there negatives to video analysis or video monitoring? Jason? You know, absolutely. With every tool in our coaching toolbox, there's there's positives and negatives for everything. Uh, you know, when I think about my experience with video, uh, it can be a little bit of a crutch and we can become, you know, almost reliant on that video and athletes and coaches are trying to develop common language and approaches to how they evaluate the technical, tactical, you know, all the different movement schemes across the various events. And so we need just we just need to be careful that we're not digging ourselves into a hole where when video isn't available on a kind of readily available basis, uh, that it's a detriment. Uh, you know, if you think about your coaching toolbox, you know, you've got a lot of tools in there. And if you've only got a hammer, everything, you know, is going to get hammered, whether it's a nail or a screw. And so try and be able to say, OK, I've got this tool, use it at the right time in the right situation is kind of the, the keys to avoiding negatives. Richard, what would you say to that question about potential negatives? Well, I agree with the cut, uh, crutch. Uh, to build on it, though, was uh, somebody, I think, uh, Laurier mentioned about athletes being visually, um, a lot of the athletes nowadays, they they grow up with video games and everything else, so they're very visual. Um, the problem I have with them seeing too many videos, and I agree that they should see, but they they start they start throwing for or not in my position they start throwing for positions versus throwing for feel. So when they're constantly looking at the video, they're trying to emulate different positions versus really learning the feel of the throw. So I think it's important that they have that feel, and the video can be a bit of a crutch for that, as well as the coach. Uh, you lose your coach's eye. Uh, things happen very quickly, and if you keep relying on the camera, you don't develop that natural eye uh, looking at that movement. It happens very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Laurie, do you want to jump in and maybe talk about how to how to avoid some of these issues? Yeah, uh, l let me just start out by saying that you know uh, I think Richard makes a good point, I, and I don't know that there. Can you hear my dog barking in the background? Is that a problem? Um, I've got a cat me meowing at my door too, so it's, okay. it's a full menagerie uh, in here. I haven't seen any literature that concludes that the use of video has a negative impact on kinesthetic awareness, but you know, herein lies the important point. You know, if if Richard waited for that literature or that research to be conducted, as opposed to using his common sense that he can see that in in some of his athletes maybe they're becoming over reliant on on video. Um, to just to, concern, to, con, to confirm his observations, he might be waiting a really long time at the expense of the athlete. Um, but in terms of things that I, you know, look at avoiding, um, one is getting too far away from the intention of the practice. So, you know, I think it's pretty well documented that athletes can really focus on a maximum of two, perhaps a third technical cue at any one time. And, what video can do is show an, a holistic overview and athletes start looking at other things beyond the one or two or three things that you've decided that the intention is for that practice. I think that that can be a, a pitfall and you have to be very careful of that. Um, I also think that on-site video review can extend practice depending on your group size and, and, and can disrupt the flow of training. Um, it can make practice extend beyond a reasonable amount of time. And especially when we're outside and it's cool, we want to be cognizant of athletes uh, cooling down between uh, repetitions. Um, and it can sometimes have a knock-on effect if you have a certain amount of time that's allocated for the gym, for example, and you don't make it to the weight room on time, uh, it could result in, in rushing training. Um, and I think for me specifically, I just can't do both things well. I can't coach and record video at the same time. Um, I know that there are other people with better eyes, technical eyes maybe than me that can do both. I'm just not that good at it. So I'm either holding the camera and recording 
and then looking at it, or I'm looking at the movement without a screen. And of course, we have some strategies for that. We allow athletes to record each other. Um, but I think that that's, that's th those are the primary concerns and mitigators for me. Cool. So that, that leads nicely to the next question, which is, you know, for me as a coach, I, the issue I always seem to have is that, yeah, I, you know, from time to time, I'll take some video and then you've got this video and it's kind of like, okay, what do I, what do I do with it now? Like you say like, okay, on, on the, on the field, like right there, okay, let's look at it now. But then you don't really have time necessarily if the group is big to go through everybody and, and distance running, which is my discipline. And we have like 15, 20 people in a group sometimes, which is a bit different from maybe like two or three or five throwers. So what are some ways that you that you manage the 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 use of it, like knowing when to use and when not to use? Who are you asking, John? Well, I uh, guess Richard, I guess Richard you can start. It seems like we're going in a bit of rotation. So, um, you know, the number of athletes you have in a workout that's that's. You know, that's a whole other discussion on how you manage your workout and your time in that workout. So if I have a pre-meeting with the athlete, I'll, it's a two-second conversation, really. It's like, okay, here, let's have an agreement. What are, we, what are we working on? And those are a couple of things. And we don't rely on video. If something's happening really great or something is wrong or not, the athlete isn't catching on, um, I may pick up the phone and videotape it and show them take it and show it to them really quickly. Um, they don't want me to do it because as Laurie said, um, I can't do both and usually I'm watching and I react to the throw. So my body movement, as soon as they release, I jerk. And as soon as I jerk, it doesn't matter what I videotape, they can't see it anyway. So there's a big joke. In fact, a couple of them, a couple of them have bought me tripods uh, for Christmas presents. So trying to work that in, but again, that's again, that's a remote and trying to coach at the same time. So it's a quick conversation that I have with the athletes at the beginning, it makes you sure we're only working on those two cues and making sure if we do look at the video, we're only looking at those two. Now, most of my athletes are senior athletes are a little older, so it's easier to focus them because as Laurie also said, video shows them everything and they can start looking at other things and it could be as hey i look really good in that outfit um but because the instagram right they always hey can you see me that can you send me that video i always get that and of course we air drop a lot of times right after the workout if you have a video or two so you've, you've got to manage it as part of your workout and expectations up front what i'll do afterwards though is i will take that video and i may do a frame by frame analysis or pull out a couple of things based on the two things that we were working on and send it to them and share it with our biomechanics people uh, i have some examples if we have time at the end to, to show okay yeah that makes sense so i think to just to kind of recap it's important to to sort of set the stage and like like any practice have a plan and know what you're going to do with the video and and just sort of keep focused on that because it is something that can potentially kind of snowball and get out of hand and then next thing you know you've got a viral instagram video of richard dropping cameras or something um so all right what i think we you know richard started to go through a little bit of the the actual kind of mechanics of it so what are what are some of the practical i guess suggestions or, or tips for using video that you would that you would uh, share with other coaches, like what are some things that you can and, and can't do with the video, or with video as a tool? Jason, you wanna jump in there? Yeah, like video can't, can't coach for you, you know? It, it's only as good of a tool as, you know, the coach and the athlete and the plan together. Uh, so for myself, you know, it's what's the biggest priority for the day? So if we're having a, a block practice, the goal is to, you know, push against the blocks, exert forces, you know, be aggressive. And if one of my athletes is, you know, <laughs> operating the camera because I'm in the same boat as everyone else is, I can't do both at the same time. You know, if the video is from a horizontal angle, what are we missing from behind? What are we missing from in front? I could do, you know, jump out of the blocks and, you know, look like a million bucks. 
but at the same time you're gonna go well it's not helping you run faster so right away having a plan at the start of practice for how it's gonna benefit and lead to kind of the goals and execution of that is priority number one after that you know you can kind of work through the checklist but if you haven't established the main goal for practice and how video is going to support that you're probably already kind of digging yourself into a hole okay laurie do you have anything on that yeah I, so you know one of the strategies that we use um to try to maximize the use of video um and couple that with you know my own coaching abilities um is to agree on a maximum number of video clips per athlete per session so we might just say you need to tell me which three reps i'm going to record today and that's it um we insist that social media recording is done by a teammate that's not done by me um, so I think that that's an important strategy. Um, and I keep asking myself if continued recording is going to be helpful to me or the athlete. If I'm recording for the sake of recording, I need to put my camera down. Um, and, and I can assess that by kind of asking myself the question whether I am going to use the next clip right now or sometime in the future and if the answer is no to both of those I am better off going to my coaching strengths and maximizing my coach athlete contact time in another way okay um so Richard you want to do you have more on that on the on just sort of the day-to-day -day video and things you can and can't do well you know there's there's some things you can't do with um technology depending on what you have when i first started coaching um the cell phones and smartphones weren't as good as they are today and i was always worried if i had the highest resolution possible on my video camera uh today's today's cell phones are you know quite adequate for looking at something the one thing you can't do is do high resolution uh, biomechanic studies so we have formal days where we have set up the three cameras around the circle uh, or two on the runway and we get different angles and we can get the height of release, speed of release and all the things that we biomechanically want to measure. Then there's the informal workouts where I will sit as we've been talking already with, with the phone in, in hand, um, not, not in hand, but you know, ready at hand if we want to use it. Um, so the informal setting and a formal setting. And, and I just, I, I don't, uh, sit there and try to do a pre-described number of videotapes. If it's happening, I'm going to pick it up uh, and, and videotape it. Um, but the formal setting, I have somebody else doing it, obviously. I have Lindsay from the High Performance Center there from the CISO. We will sit there and do the biomechanics study for us. Um, the other good place to do it is, as well as uh, World Championship or Major. Um, Usually the coach's box is uh, 30 meters away and there's always obstacles in the way, scoreboards, athletes, another race going on the track. Uh, Dana Way always finds a way to get a really good view. I, I don't know how he does it, but he sneaks into places and um, as long as the internet is good, he can send me a video and we have 16, 20 minutes and I can look at the video and make sure what I saw is what I saw before I communicate to the athlete. Um, in Doha, the internet wasn't good, so it didn't work. Um, so you had to rely on your own eyes. Um, but in 2017, um, when I was quarantined in the hotel for two days, I missed both the qualifying and the final. So we, uh, we set up a system where Dana would take the video from the stadium, text it to me. I would sit there in the hotel room, watch it, and then I would text, uh, text uh, Tim Nadeau who had my coaches pass, Tim would then communicate to Brittany. Um, that's how she got through qualifying. And then because my core team got extended, that's how she got sixth at Worlds, uh, was the help of the team. Of, uh, Tim and um, so, so, so we should have there had was Tim a good use of video. Here, what you're saying. <laughs> oh, he's frozen uh, now. Most likely. <laughs> so that's actually a great story to, to segue. The next question was going to be, so we mostly we've been talking about in practice, but 
how does video fit into into the competition process? So Richard's given us some really cool, um, you know, high performance international examples. Um, Jason, Laurie, do you guys want to talk about um, what you guys have done in competition with video? Laurie, sure. go ahead. Yeah, I, I for field events, I actually like it better than for training purposes. I like it better in in competition, and I, I think selfishly for me, the tempo of a competition. Uh, and the fact that the next athlete up is probably not someone I'm coaching, unlike in training where all six javelin throwers or all four high jumpers are all people that I have to work with and that have unique cues and uh, technical uh, improvements that we're working on, and they're all different, right? Um, it's more likely in a competition that I have one or two athletes, they're spaced appropriately apart, so that I can reflect on video um, without feeling rushed. I can look specifically at the one or two cues that we're working on with that specific athlete without trying to think, okay, who's up next and what are their cues? Um, so I find that to be a, a lot more helpful uh, and, and you know, we're able to communicate and make tweaks. Even without the athlete seeing the video, of course, in competition, my ability to, to oftentimes because of the distance that Richard identifies, um, but I find it a lot more useful for me to make, you know, minor changes in, in competition than major ones in training. Cool. Okay. Yeah, you know, we know that, competition is different than practice and there's different stimulus different stresses and you can have an athlete who is a practice warrior and they look like a million bucks but you put them in the meat and you know technique stress you know whatever it is uh it falters and so for me it you know it's it's the end goal the end goal is competition it's not you know can you can you run 990 in practice but then run 1090 in competition well, you're not executing that. And you can use that competitive video to maybe identify some factors that you didn't always see in practice, in the practice environment. So, you know, what aren't you seeing in practice can really be highlighted in competition. Cool. All right, so the next question is um, maybe a highly anticipated one, I'm not sure, but I wanted to ask what, what kind of hardware and software do you typically use um, and and maybe this is a good moment for Richard to pull up some of his pictures to show us sort of the the, the result and some of the stuff that he's that he's got on there. Um, but I know uh, I know Jason and, and Laurie don't necessarily have things to pull up. So if you guys want to go first, and then we can kind of get Richard to prepare his uh, his his slides or whatever. Is that cool? Yep. Yeah. So I uh, used um, to just before we do that. Everyone. Good, Richard. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah, Kyle looked after. Software like like you know Dartfish used to have. Uh, I used to rely on that a lot more, especially when I was trying to train my own coach's eye. Um. But honestly, so first off, if I were recommending apps. Uh, for people to use, I would go to the golf world because there's a lot more money in golf and you can get really good apps on your phone um, through some of that, through, I think Huddle is one. Um, but again, I wanna be clear, I don't really use them anymore. What I do do, and I think I have a way better uh, piece of software, and that is I have an incredible group of mentors in different events um, that are more than willing to analyze any video that I send them. And so that's been really helpful. Um, and, and, you know, I think that this goes beyond video and, and to any part of your coaching development. Um, if you can surround yourself or get access to some good mentors, um, people who understand the event better than you do, um, then you're gonna be in really good shape to communicate quite inexpensively, freely, um, and and get some assessment from some of the world's best. So, uh, you know, I have no hesitation with he sending um, Fuzz Ahmed or Dan Paff high jump videos. 
Um, you know, I have uh, certainly communicated with Larry Stanky and Derek Evely on throws videos. So, you know, just developing a group of people that you respect um, that are willing to, you know, give you five minutes of their time every once in a while, I think is probably the best software you can purchase. So we should send our videos to you, Laurie, is what you're saying. Well, it depends how big the collective we is, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like, I, I know you're kind of kidding, but I'm part of that educational continuum and there are people that send stuff to me. I've been fortunate to have great mentors and if I can give a little bit of that back, why wouldn't I, you know? For sure, that's great. Jason? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I've always got my phone in my pocket, iPhone 11 Pro, uh, but really I have an iPad that's dedicated to video. Um, I'm a big fan of Coach's Eye. I've been using it now quite extensively for the last kind of 10 years. Um, signed up for the pro account, you know, pay a couple hundred bucks a year and uh, so you get all the storage. But, you know, I, I've found that it's very usable. Uh, you know, the big thing is I don't want to hand my phone out to just anyone. <laughs> if one of my kids drops my phone, that's a much bigger issue than uh, if they drop the iPad because that's the only thing that's on it. Cool. All right, Richard, you ready to show us your screen? I think so. Um, Here we go. Show up. Yeah. So, like, the first one is the formal setting where we've actually had the biomechanics out. And this is a video of Brittany, just a sample of high speed resolution that's giving us a lot of the angles of the knees, the speed of between right and left contact, height of release. Uh, angle of release, and of course, it also shows us that she fouls uh, in workouts, which she's not allowed to. Um, so, you know, at slow speed, we got everything moving. Um, there's three cameras involved, one on either side and one, um, one up the back. And that's, that's from 2017, I believe. Um, then you know what I basically what we could do with that is then we show people or measure these are different events that she's been to um, and the distances and we measure the differences of right and left foot takeoff and getting back into double support. Um, so this is all done from the videos that we take. Um, and also well here here's another example. So we want to talk about showing the camera here's here's me videotaping um let me set this up this is uh sarah minton throwing 1884 in new zealand and auckland uh in february and this is me videotaping <laughs> So you can see the juggling at the end and that's actually really good for me However, I'd rather have this. The New Zealand folks were lucky. Uh, they're nice enough that they'll share everything with us. And I have this from two different angles, from back and from the side. And you can see the high resolution. And it's not going to be jumpy. It's not going to jump all around and uh, miss uh, or cut off somebody's head uh, in the video. So I prefer somebody else holding the camera or getting the biomechanic video from uh, the uh, NOC that's that's doing it. Sorry, I should have started this video a little bit earlier. But this is goes just the high speed. This shows an example of um, what we use. All right. Yeah, so I think there was a bit of a delay on that. At least it was on my end. I don't know about uh, you guys. So if, if people didn't fully see it, um, maybe Richard will work on a way to uh, a way to get get that in a place where people can see it uh, a little more fluidly. But um, it's it's still it's so cool to to see it. You know, to see the the graph and how you you know you kind of taken all that video and all those measurements and then sort of looked at it over time as well. So it's not always just video of like one thing and here's what you're doing in one thing, but a an accumulation of of data, which is uh, which is always interesting. Um, 
Well, we're always we're always looking at the you know you build your technical model for at one time it was 18 meters now it's, we're building it for 19 and 20 meters depending on the thrower, and we're always measuring it towards that technical model of what we know the absolute speed we know the shot to, we need the shot to be released at to go a certain distance. Frankly, it's just a it's a physics equation. Um, is are, are you all having a problem with my video connection here? So speaking of videos. Yeah, I was. It seems is my like internet connection slow. bad. All right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. It's okay. All right. Cool. So, I mean, that's that's the the sort of the plan portion. We got a bunch of good questions from the audience, so I'll just um, I'll just start throwing them out there. The first one is from uh, Leslie Astwick, and the question is: Do you schedule filming and analysis into your annual plan? And if so, how much during what phases? Well, um, if, Leslie, we we do because I have to I have to book the biomechanics. For instance, um, I will have a camera at a I'm pretty casual videotaping at any workout, but when I need to book biomechanics, we usually do it around peak comp or uh, peak competition time or moving in from uh, heavy transmutation into re realization when I know the athlete is going to be moving and having a better feel for it. I don't bother with a lot of biomechanic analysis when I know the athlete's pretty beaten up. Um, I usually, usually come back when they're in a better, better fit and better competitive phase, better uh, competitive re ready. I don't have a line item on an Excel spreadsheet that says, um, timelines or specific dates for recording um, but that doesn't mean that it's not built in kind of intuitively uh, it's it's not something obviously when we're not throwing we're not recording and and oftentimes while we don't get too far away from some of these I say throwing or jumping or hurdling um, but but you know during what's traditionally referred to as a general preparation phase we're probably not doing a, a lot of recording unless we're trying to make some kind of promotional video. Um, and, and then even when we initiate more technical components, uh, we give athletes an opportunity to adjust to the new stimulus before we start pulling out the cameras. Um, and so I think that the, there are certainly timelines that we use um, that are appropriate for video analysis. Um, but I wouldn't say that they're formal. If I had to submit my documents to Athletics Canada, um, they wouldn't see within those documents uh, a specific line item or a column that discusses recording technique. Yeah, I'd support Laurie on that. Uh, you know, back in the fall, um, Michelle Harrison was a hurdler that I work with. We did a lot of experimentation with her start really early on in the season, you know, in September. And, you know, nothing was over hurdles, but it was, okay, let's let's put the pad forward. Let's put it back. And, you know, and it was it was a fun time to experiment. And was it linked in to, you know, competitive race results? Not even close. But giving the opportunity to, you know, evaluate video, do it in a bit of a, you know, sequential manner where we had some kind of key key landmarks we were trying to associate with it was you know it was part of the plan but at the same time you know it's it is a bit of an ebb and flow based off of that coach athlete dialogue and what you're seeing within the daily training environment cool okay uh, another question from steven novasad uh steven's actually a cross-country ski coach uh, in sprinting or even distance, have you ever combined video analysis with data from an accelerometer or another tool of that nature? So I'll, I'll go first on that one. Uh, I have not because I don't have access to uh, readily available accelerometers. But what I have been able to do is kind of link in a few other videos and try and get, uh, you know, link it into stride length because we have some landmarks on the track. Uh, you know, try and look at some angles and try and combine as many data points as possible. But, you know, I guess the, the amount of tools that you have at your disposal and what your intended benefit is from that is what you need to reflect on and evaluate. So we've played with this a little bit. 
Um, not specifically an accelerometer, which, you know, I think primarily for our use, we, we'd put it in the weight room. Um, but JB Moran has some really interesting research on this. And he has an app, or, or at least he promotes an app. It's not his. Um, and, and he is not affiliated with it. He just thinks it's a great app. Uh, and it's called iSprint. And there's another one called iJump. But iSprint um, shows you how to record and very accurately time a 30 meter acceleration. And by being 30 meters away and then having points at, at you know, specific landmark points so that you can. Uh, you can time it. Um, and the philosophy is, is that there are multiple ways to get to 30 meters. Some people have exceptional power. They can accelerate very well, but their maximal speed qualities aren't as high and they get there in whatever, 3.8 seconds. Other people have very good maximal speed qualities, but they're not as good at accelerating in the first few steps out of the blocks. And they get there in the exact same time. But because you can use the app to see the, um, the velocity curve, uh, you can then direct training based on their strengths and weaknesses. So if they're already really strong, maybe it's sensible to focus more on maximal velocity. If they're already really good at maximal velocity, then the theory is that perhaps you have the most to gain by focusing on strength development. So we've played around a little bit with that, um, and it's a really easy app to download. I think it cost me seven bucks. Cool. Um, I mean, it was a sprint distance question. I don't know if Richard, you have anything to add on that? I'm just, uh, you had mentioned using a couple different camera angles and stuff. Are there any other tools that you, you use with video? Well, we've actually tried to use a uh, radar gun to try to guess the mate and see how close it got to the biomechanical data. Uh, radar gun's a lot easier to hold, but you got to find the implement, uh, which makes it tough. But uh, we've, we've experimented with that. Not a lot of great detail to help Matt or meet the uh, biomechanical data we get from the three cameras, but, you know, it's always looking at different things. Cool. So right, the next question is from Brett. Now, oh, sorry. Speak, right? The next question is from Brett Lumley. Um, Brett asks, the use of frame by frame or slow motion can sometimes show extra information. Um, but how do you direct your athletes to ignore the extra information and, and presumably focus on the, the good information? Herein lies the challenge with video, Brett. Like that is exactly the problem we have. And um, it, you know, this whole idea that you really try to focus on the two or three cues that you started practice with and and try to assist athletes in focusing only on those and continue to say the same thing over and over but in different we're using different words that's my best strategy or else we have to put the cameras away because you know i think richard and jason have both pointed out as well the the problem with video is that it shows everything it shows everything good and bad and it's so easy to look at things that you're not even talking about um, and and can create a lot of distraction. It's it's a problem for sure. You know we know we know that the body is you know biomechanically linked, and what I do on the left side is going to be compensated on the right. And so when I'm using video and trying to identify you know those those outcomes and landmarks, it, it's there's also a coaching you know process with the athlete and trying to explain to them you know, and, and make them, you know, a student of the sport and say, hey, listen, you're going to see this. Tell me, do you think this is actually impacting what we're trying to work on today? And, you know, if we're hurdling and we're looking at a, you know, a wide, you know, arm coming across, you know, kind of in sync with the trail leg, it's probably linked to the two or three steps before takeoff. And, you know, so it's that net result of everything coming together rather than just that one frame. And so there's a teaching component to, to the athletes and, you know, and trying to just weed out the noise. Cool. Um, so related to some of the stuff that you guys have just said, the next question from Allison Doherty is, what do you do when an athlete asks for video, but you don't plan on using it or you don't think it's necessary? Do you just shut it down or 
Yeah, in, in this scenario, oh, we'll start by ask no, no, no. another athlete to record. Okay. Richie? I, I, I would just ask them why why do they need it? Yeah. Can you even hear me? Yeah. My internet's that, that one, not bad. Why, why do you need oh, it? Oh, here I am. So I would ask them why they want it. Why you want it, and if they could give a good reason, sure, we'll videotape it. Right? I'm I'm not gonna fight them over them wanting a video. It's it's uh, let's take the video. Yeah. It's all about the athlete making sure they're happy. And if I can have a happy workout and a happy athlete, I'm gonna be happier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, like, what, what's the worst thing of taking that video? You know, you you miss one rep as a coach. Okay. If we're you know if we've got a well thought out plan and we've got an appropriate amount of training time, you know, and let's just say we're, we're in, you know, long jumping, we're going to have, you know, five, 10, 12 takeoffs that day. I can, I can leave one out. You know, I, I can, I can, you know, assist the athlete with their goals and their objectives and give them a video. And if they, they might see something that I didn't, and it might turn out to be a little bit of a, a benefit that we didn't account for. So, you know, there's, there's needles in a haystack everywhere, and sometimes you just need to be a little bit of a yes man and say, you know, sure, sure, you got it. Okay. Um, the next question, actually, um, maybe I'll just address it quickly. The question is, what resource material does Athletics Canada have for video technical analysis, and does the resource teach coaches how to apply technical analysis specifically for distance runners? Um, so I, I'd say there's there's not much. Um, we have started to to create a kind of a drill library i wouldn't say that it's really analysis more uh, than just sort of examples of different movements um so you know it's it's material to work with you'd still need to have the kind of expertise to be able to look at that and and and, and analyze it and that you know kind of goes back to what laurie was saying about talking with other coaches and and that sort of thing um in the uh the performance coach uh, clinic, there is a, a fairly significant section on video analysis. So the, the learning facilitators and the other coaches in that clinic, um, you guys would all kind of get together and, and work on that stuff. So there are a few opportunities for it. Um, I mean, you know, this is you know kind of maybe a jumping off point for us, this discussion and, and maybe working towards some more, uh, you know, more learning about it. I think, you know, we're, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot right now. So hopefully everyone else is too. Um, so that's kind of all I can say on that for, for now. Um, so we have a couple other questions here from Trevor Windle. That's a good question. Um, are the use of drones becoming more popular with regards to unique angles with overhead views? Are you guys using drones for your video analysis? Please say yes. <laughs> Hate to disappoint. No, no drones. Um, Rich is going to say yes. Yeah. We have one. We have one, but we're not allowed to fly it oh. because the, the facility has rules about videotaping, and unless you get everybody in the facility to sign off on it, you can't use it. And plus, there's also height flight restrictions inside. So inside's a no-no. Outside, uh, we start to try and we use it at the Pan Am Stadium for a workout, and it's cool. Uh, Sarah Mitten actually used uh, her own video camera and tied it to the garage, to the top of the garage where she was been training during isolation. And uh, so her own creativity, it's not a drone, but she stuck one up there on uh, uh, one of the one of the beams of the garage right above the circle that she and her dad built. And uh, it was cool. We've got a lot of good feedback from it because you can really see the, ax the axis of the hips and the shoulders from that angle. So uh -huh. uh, I would like to use it more. But you talk about somebody flying a drone versus holding a camera. I'm not flying a drone and coach. I'll kill yeah. somebody with that thing. Or, or the drone will get a shot put through it or something. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, Larry, no comment on the drone? No. No, yeah, well, we, so, my, I have a couple of athletes who are in the engineering department at UBC and they're fascinated by the use of drones. And so um, our problem is, is that UBC is quite close to the airport and so we have some no-fly zones there. 
uh, and we do most of our training camps at the University of Arizona in Tucson, uh, which is directly a military flight path. Um, so they've done it themselves at other venues. Again, this mostly becomes an Instagram video and not a technical analysis video. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, but to say that I've used it um, as a coaching tool would be completely misleading. I just think it's really cool when they do these things and I get to see them over hurdles from above. It, it's yeah. it's more neat at this stage than it is useful. Not couldn't be useful because to Richard's point about access movements through the sagittal plane, like it's a great way, or sorry, through the transverse plane, it's it's the best way to see that stuff. Um, it's just, it, it's not super practical right now uh, for, because of our geographic location, but also, yes, because I can't fly a drone yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's another sort of technical skill the coach needs to learn. <laughs> okay, um, we got a few more questions. We've got more time, so we'll just keep rolling here. Um, uh, John Kraskowski asks, how often are the full biomechanical assessments performed each year? How, how many times a year do you do the, the sort of biomechanical assessment? I think that's a question for Richard because we, he has uh, probably significantly more access than we do. Hmm. Yeah, so so I'll uh, I don't know if I'm showing up here or not. If I'm speaking, can you guys hear me? There we go. So um, we will do them again, as, and as we get close to competition or certain periods of time during the year. So I will probably borrow Lindsay um, half dozen times a year. I could probably get her more if I asked for it. Uh, it's really kind of great that we have her there. Um, and uh, then, of course, at all the majors, we we ask if the country that's hosting the major, uh, like Tucson Elite, U.S. Track and Field shares the information. Uh, New Zealand shared all the information at their nationals in Auckland. So you have to ask them, and they'll give it to you. But in training, uh, maybe half times a uh, half dozen times a year. Okay. There was sort of a follow-up to that from John, which is, are, are the biomechanical assessments limited to 3D motion capture analysis? Um, the way we do it, yes. Okay. All right. So the next question, there are two people who asked this um, about video analysis in the weight room. Basically, do you, do you do it? Do you use it in the weight room as well? Mm -hmm. Laurier, the question was. Yeah, we, uh, uh, we have uh, in the weight room. Sorry, just catching Laurier up there. Yeah, go heard ahead. It. Yeah, probably a better place for us because I have uh, less of a coaching eye in the weight room than I do on the track or in the field. Um, having said that, I'm always cognizant that we don't have to be perfect technically in the weight room. We need to be perfect technically on the track or in the field. We need to be good enough so that we're not getting hurt when we're trying to lift more. But we don't want to get caught in trying to be perfect Olympic lifters, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I, I, so we have a, I have a push band, uh, and we've done some velocity-based training measurements and programs. And, you know, combining video with that information has, I guess, you know, just provided more information and more questions. It's allowed us to ask more specific questions in regards to athlete development within certain ranges of motion uh, and trying to really build out the best program possible. So I think video in the weight room, you know, your, your degrees of freedom uh, get a little smaller. Your bandwidth of what you're looking for is in a squat much easier than in a full hurdle, you know, start to the hurdle. Uh, you've got less you know, less noise to deal with. So it can be, it can help you out for sure. Cool. Richard, are you using it in the weight room too? We use it um, occasionally. I've used the uh, strength and conditioning coaches. They'll, they'll be the coach if they want to make an adjustment to somebody's technique. Most of the videos in the weight room, they get put on Instagram. Uh, they're athletes uh, showing how good they've become. You know, there's more Instagram weight room videos than I than I need to see, but that's where most of those videos show up. Okay. Not really in coaching. 
<laughs> so here's a question from John Stevenson. Do you ever use video as a baseline for development and confidence builder uh, ahead of major competition? So just sort of to show an athlete kind of a, this is how far you improve before and after kind of situation. Oh, absolutely. Ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like yeah, it's, yes, no. it's perhaps the, the best use of video outside of the coaching venue. So I haven't found a lot of success in giving athletes homework, right? Like sending them videos, having them look at them in the evening and seeing if we can come back 48 hours and improve technique. I just haven't had a lot of success. It, my, my greater successes are looking at what just happened and then trying to change the next rep. But in terms of confidence, capturing athletes or catching them doing things right and sending them that ahead of competitions is the best use of video. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost part of a peaking tool. Hmm. You know, and it's, it's pretty easy to, you know, use iMovie or sure. other, you know, video editing software and put together a little montage video. Uh, you know, to say, hey, here's where you were last year. Here's the three things that we really focused on, you know, over this season. Look at how much you improved. And, you know, an athlete can sit there and go, oh, yeah, you know, I see that. And whether they're actually seeing it or not, they're going, okay, yeah, I was running faster. I was performing better. Here's a progression. Here's some, you know, they can touch it. They can see the video. It, it's going to have a positive effect on what they're kind of building towards. Cool. I, you know, I think anytime, anytime the athlete, any anytime the athlete can not just hear that they're doing well, but also see it, is a confidence boost. It's not just me saying, "Hey, look what you're doing right." They can go, "Oh man, look at that!" And especially during these times, or when if, if an athlete's away in Europe and I'm not there, and they need a little hand holding, or they can send me a video, and I go, "Holy mackerel, look what you're doing!" And I can do a, a frame by frame on, I don't use any secret weapons or anything. I use PowerPoint and I drop in a PowerPoint and I send it to them. Like even right now with isolation, uh, Sarah Mittens in uh, Nova Scotia and Brittany's in Guelph and I'm nowhere, I'm somewhere in between. So they sent it to me and, and we're having, they both had great workouts the past week. So um it's 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 a terrific um motivational tool yeah um cool so that i think um leads us into another question which is from ron cuffey have you become more reliant on video while we're practicing social distancing oh yeah i have to they're you have to they're not here They're, uh, so the athletes aren't here, I so I've had to be. I can show you examples. Go ahead. Good learning. Um, so the yeah, athletes so, are here, uh, so I've been using it. Keep talking. <laughs> okay, my internet on. sucks. <laughs> I think it's my internet sucks. I'm, I apologize. You're at a Go secret ahead. location. That's okay often vary with yeah. not very much internet so you know i think you have to consider your uh, um who you're coaching and for me primarily outside of liz right now uh liz gledo the vast majority of the athletes that i'm working with are uh university varsity athletes who have lost their summer season and who are not in a position to explore the uh, Australia New Zealand season that starts in November right so outside of our endurance runners at UBC who you know we certainly haven't written off cross-country season and and the possibility that they may compete is in September October November all of our power speed athletes are now 11 and a half months or 11 months away from their next outdoor competition like a long way away from our need for them to be able to um you know be track successful um and yet up until social isolation they've been training since september 
Well, September 2019 till March, mid-March 2021, 18 months without a competition and uh, and no break, I think would have been, it would have done a huge disservice to our athletes. And so we've allowed this time, uh, and especially because they've been in final exams, to be um, more of a menu-based training uh, in which we kind of have it a la carte, right? Here are some things that if you don't feel comfortable leaving your house that you can do on the living room floor. If you feel comfortable getting to a grass field, here are some other things that you can do. Now just report back to me on what you did and didn't do so I can understand where to go next week. Um, but it has been very general in nature. Uh, again, Liz Gleedal aside, because she does have the resources, the ability, the wherewithal and the time to get to uh, Australia and New Zealand for that, their summer season, um, it, you know, if it if it's going to be on. So for everyone else, I just didn't feel it was valuable for us to go 18 months hard without a break. And so for that reason, we haven't really used video yet, but it's going to come. At some point we know, we will know that, you know, when our next competition date is going to be, and we're going to have to ramp up. Um, if we're still in socialization, uh, isolation, isolation, isolation um, video is going to be a really important uh, tool for us. Okay. We have a couple more questions that I want to at least be able to get, you know, maybe one answer each on. So um, Steve LeBlanc uh, wants to know, do you primarily use video for qualitative analysis or quantitative analysis? Go, Jason. Okay. <laughs> uh, qualitative for myself. You know, I think that Sometimes hard numbers can get in the way of good kinesthetic feel and the athlete building confidence for trying to execute movement patterns. Uh, if you start attaching, you know, real objective quantitative aspects to that, it can almost negate a really good execution where they felt that they did a few things right and um, the body finds a way to perform. And so sometimes we need to be okay with um, not having all the numbers and Steve I know you're a, a biomechanist and <laughs> guy and so trying to adjust that is I'm a qualitative guy okay um cool I'm gonna I'm gonna ask another question and we'll uh just keep kind of rolling through because I think we're like two minutes and Kyle Kyle wants me to to stop I don't want to stop this is really good um so a question from Emma Doucette as a coach who is mainly working with newer athletes at the high school level, do you think that video analysis is a useful tool uh, depending on the learning style of the athlete? So for that, for younger, newer athletes. Yeah, but I, I think it goes back to group size and practicality around, you know, your specific training environment. Um, generally speaking, but not always, the younger the group, the more athletes you have to contend with and the higher the coach to athlete ratio. So just consider if that's the most valuable uh, way for you to use your coaching time, I would say. Having said that, can athletes at a young age learn from video? 100% they can, and it's it's a really useful tool. Great, um, okay, there's one more question here from Paul Gallus. Paul asks, um, what are your thoughts on setting time aside for film sessions so we talked about this a bit at the beginning with you know how to how to make it fit so saying okay we're going to come in 30 minutes before or staying 30 minutes after to review film like sort of how you know team like football would have like you know a video video practice would you guys consider doing that absolutely <laughs> yeah i haven't but there's lots of merit lots of merit to that Cool. Good. Okay, there were a couple other questions that were maybe a little more directed. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm just sort of leave them off for now and I'll send them to the presenters and then maybe they can get back to people um, through us in, individually. But I, I want to say thanks guys. This has been um, really informative, um, really rich discussion. Uh, you know, I think that it's a topic that everyone is is interested in in the sense that in all event groups i think all coaches think of video as like oh that's a thing i need to do and and there's a lot of reasons why we don't um and i think you've given us some good reasons to 
to try and some good uh, sort of steps to on how to do it as well. Because I think it's, it is a very accessible tool for coaches. Um, it's not something, you know, you need to be afraid of necessarily. Um, you know, so I, I think that, you know, you guys have really uh, shared some great knowledge. So I want to want to thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to say as well, so that's, uh, you know, this is our our third. We have many. Uh, we're going to be here every Wednesday uh, at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, so if you want to register for next week, next week we've got some endurance case studies. We're going to talk uh, to Brent Satchel, who's uh, also at UBC, like Laurier, Mark Bamba, and Mike Van Tegum, just about uh, some individual endurance case studies. So you can head over to athletics.ca slash coaching slash e-learning, that's e-learning, and there's a webinar tab, and that's where you can sign up. Um, that's also where you can find, uh, in about 24 hours time, uh, the link to the recording of this session. So if you wanted to go back and watch again and, and, uh, and sort of get, you know, if there was something you missed or you wanted to hear again, you can do that. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thanks again, guys. It was really great. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. And, um, yeah, stay safe, everyone. Thanks, John. Got a high quality audience. Any one of those could have been presenting, I think. Yeah, good questions. Thank you, people, for your great questions. Thank you. All right, cool. Well, see you later, John. Okay. Thanks, John. That was good. Thank you.